the world coming to an end. The message from the government's chief medical officer is don't panic. The bad news is that initial calculations show that the asteroid will hit the Earth on February the 1st. The will melt the polar ice caps and in 60 years' time will be sloshing around under 16 and a half feet of extra seawater. People have been predicting the end of the world for more than 2,000 years. From the Bible to the bomb, it is a defining concept of Western civilization. And if one reads the book of Revelation, there you get the most detailed description of the abolition of the present world as replacement by a completely new and different world. But where once we feared the wrath of God, Today, the churches of science and technology provide us with limitless opportunities to predict a man-made Armageddon. I think the last 10, 20 years, we've seen uh, panics uh, being promoted on virtually every human experience. And the global media is always ready to act the prophet of doom. We're all part of the same hypocrisy. The fundamental fact is that catastrophe sells. But in the 21st century, is there really any proof that we are approaching our apocalypse now? Wembley Stadium, August 1969. The Jehovah's Witnesses hold an international assembly, their biggest yet in London, and perhaps their last. They're waiting for the end of the world, they believe Armageddon will happen in 1975, a bloody battle between God and Satan which only the witnesses will survive. It's a very serious responsibility, and it makes this assembly a matter of life and death. In 1969, the Jehovah's Witness movement represented an extreme view of the end of the world. But there is a long tradition in the Christian faith of apocalyptic prophecy. Of course, the end of the world in Christian minds was very much associated with the second coming of Jesus. And without that, it would have had no meaning for early Christians. There is one feature of the apocalyptic tradition which it's worth bearing in mind, and that is the concept of the elite and the damned, the saved and the damned, which has played a very, very large part in uh, the whole apocalyptic tradition. It's always a minority of the saved, the true believers, the true followers of Jesus or whatever it may be, they will be the saved, they will inherit the new glorious coming world, and the rest will either be abolished or cast into hell or whatever. And something of this kind of belief went on into the so-called secular religions, the apocalyptic religions of our time. In the 1960s, the most vocal of these religions, the Jehovah's Witnesses, had built up their numbers through aggressive doorstep evangelism in a way that alerted them to a media that was more than ready to investigate their claims of the imminence of Armageddon. The reason we set out to make this programme is because they asked us to. And since they brought the subject up, we found the private aspects of the New World Society, the dedicated lives to which they were committed, were pretty intriguing. Nothing we discovered made us change our minds. In addition to courting the media, the Jehovah's Witnesses also made use of what they called proof to explain and support their beliefs. We can actually prove that 1914 was the beginning of the time of the end and the beginning of these signs, consequently. The year 1914? Oh, yes. It's clearly laid out in prophecy in the Bible. Prove it. Well, OK, uh, this does take some time, so I'll try and keep it as brief as possible. This happened in the year 607 BC, according to witness chronology. Nebuchadnezzar would be punished for a length of seven times. We're given a very important clue, now a key expression. A day for a year, a day for a year, is what I have given you. We merely need to multiply by seven. Now, this is the symbolic length of time God will allow to pass before he re-establishes his earthly kingdom. And perhaps you'd like to work out what year we arrive at. 1914. However, not all the witnesses were convinced. Alan Rogerson found the prospect of impending Armageddon unpersuasive. After a childhood spent door to door, Alan left the movement and wrote a book deconstructing the witnesses' obsession with the apocalypse. 
This was an attempt to clarify my own mind uh, what had happened to them objectively, if possible, and what kind of organization they were. Because initially, all that happened to me was that I found I, I couldn't honestly convince myself of the belief about Armageddon and the belief about the battle of Satan and Jehovah. I couldn't accept it uh, as a personal thing. Later, I began to see that there were reasons, rational reasons, perhaps, why uh, they were, these ideas were not so convincing. I think one reason why they brought up this date, although the witnesses will never say this, is to keep members in the movement and to bring more people in. When the date fails, I suppose it's inevitable that some people will drop away. But the witnesses in the past, and I feel also in the future, will reinterpret the history so that everything seems to predict their latest pronouncement. And they did this, of course, over 1914, and they survived 1925, and I think they'll survive 1975, and they may well go on surviving any other new date simply on the prospect of the imminence of Armageddon. This is the final end of the world. That is, as long as they feel it's coming shortly, and they don't tie themselves down too emphatically in print, I think they can just go on surviving. And as we know, it didn't happen, but they're still convinced that it will happen in the relatively near future, and that is why they're doing their proselytizing work all over the world, and doing it so strongly. Preaching the message outside the home is one thing, but for some families, the pressure of the message at the dinner table was too much. He was marvellously unhappy and he changed to so serious and worried. And every day he brought the paper home and you know the tragedies that happened, the train crashes and the earthquake in Agadir and all this business. And it's all in the Bible and they're all signs. And here's another sign. I said, well, why the hell didn't you warn the people that was going to happen? If it's in the Bible, why didn't you tell them? That was the first day that I really thought, this is ridiculous, this is going, this is affecting the children. He got this big textbook and started on these hourly Bible studies with it. And this is when these, these awful pages, these quite frightful pictures, and they, they, the houses and buildings toppling down and people falling into a pit and all about, bodies and you you know it'll all happen to you if you don't become a Jehovah's Witness. While the witnesses prepared for salvation, elsewhere Christian Armageddon was being replaced by the threat of the man-made apocalypse of the atom bomb. I think the reason why in the 50s and 60s suddenly we went from the wrath of the gods to our own stupidity being the potential cause came because I think then people suddenly realized we did have the potential with you know, nuclear weapons to do things. So you had the, the scientists who developed atomic weapons and then the hydrogen bombs feeling collectively very, very guilty about this. The world would not be the same. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that, one way or another. I think that this is the greatest single disaster in the history of mankind. Will nobody ever stop the scientists? Will somebody put them in a bag and tie them up? <laughs> or into a lethal chamber? Before they completed our destruction. But the 1950s was a decade of rapid development and there was little room for these apocalyptic fears in the upbeat mood created by the prospect of a world transformed by computers. A world of scientific advance fueled by safe, clean nuclear energy. Atomic scientists, by a series of brilliant discoveries, have brought us to the threshold of a new age. It is with pride that I now open Calder Hall Britain's first atomic power station. With everyone prepared to endorse the shiny nuclear age, science and the media teamed up to provide endless proof that the future had arrived. When I grew up, I used to read encyclopedias that were all pink, and we had steam trains, and it was Britain, and science was going to, we were going to be eating sort of space meals or something. It was all mapped out, you know, Dan Dare did it in the Eagle comic. At every level of popular culture, science was, was, was a positive thing. The future was something to be working towards. 